morning. Trust your week went well, ready for a weekend, and then 2018 is on its way, knocking on our door already. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Reading from the New Living, and this, and we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, discarding its shame. And now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. The Berean translation says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for 2017. We thank you for 2018. And we commit ourselves to you as we enter into the new year. In Jesus' name, we pray. Help us to hear this morning what you have to share to us. Help me speak it with simplicity, clarity. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. We're living in a desert, sort of. Just go beyond the city, and we find no mountains, few trees, very few landmarks. I want us to picture for a minute this scenario. You're out for a walk, headed in a direction. You've got a goal, and it comes to noontime, and you stop. have your lunch. While you're having lunch, the clouds come over so that you cannot see where the sun is sitting. A wind comes up and blows away your footpaths. You can't see where you've just come from. You don't have a compass with you. And you finish your lunch. And now you want to move forward. A question is, which direction do you go? How are you going to tell? All markings are gone. The clouds hide the sun, so you can't even wait an hour to see which way it's going. The wind has blown your tracks away, no compass. And then you stand there, and perhaps there's a team of you and then you say, let's go forward. And everyone looks at each other. Which way is forward? And so this person goes this way. No, it's this way. This one goes this way. And this one runs off this way. Directionless. What we need in life is we need markers. Correct? In order to achieve that simple word forward, we need markers. And it starts with a goal. It starts with somewhere to go, but if you can't see anything, if there's no mountains, no trees, nothing, there's n absolutely nothing there but absolute desert. Whichever direction you look, it all looks the same. Left in a little bit of a helpless situation. Hebrews 12 tells us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And as long as we're fixing our eyes on Jesus, we have a direction in which we can go. Correct? Now that other example is a physical life uh, example. How much more true that is in the spirit. We find many people who do not have a fixed goal direction. Landmarks, what is there? They, they look around and uh, whether it's positive landmarks or negative, but they don't seem to be in any direction. There's no goal. How do you move forward? And you find many people in life walking literally in circles or worse yet, discouraged and just sitting there because they don't know where forward is. Or they're moving in a direction <laughs> and then they end up in some valley and wonder how on earth we ever got there. It is so vital in our physical world to have directions, to have signs, to have a goal, to have a destination, and then to be able to read our past. Well, Let's take a look a little bit here of uh, this whole concept of goal. Knowing where to go begins, knowing where to go begins with having a goal. 
It's the first thing in life. And I believe we as Christians, as we look towards 2018, it's one of the first things that should be established in our lives is that we have goals. As we review 2017, we've set up markers. I trust we've set up markers. But then as we look for 2018, we should also be having goals and, and dreams and destinations. There's a few words there that we use, whether you use the word uh, vision or um, dreams, uh, destiny, these different words that, that come up we simply provoke some questions. And the first question would be like, who am I? Who am I? If you have a particular dream or destiny, if you choose a certain career path, you have to ask yourself, not just uh, can I do the technical skill, but do I want to do that kind of a job for the rest of my life? Because what we choose as a career should reflect, in part, who we are. There is nothing worse, and you've seen them, maybe you even work with some, who are at their job and they absolutely hate their job. Their character isn't fit for the job. They'd rather be doing something else. Miserable people to work with. It's not nice. Now, I know no one in here in this room fits that category. But you work, perhaps, with some who do. And so the obvious, and everyone else stands around and says simply, well, find a different job. Find something that you want to do. Find something that answers the question, who am I? What has God put me on this earth for? And what can I do to the best of my capacity and ability? And so for some, for 2018, that may mean some changes that is coming up. And once we understand who we are and what God has gifted us to do, then we move forward and ask ourselves, what is my goal? Which, which destination am I going towards? And for the younger people that are here, that means usually picking the right education, going in the, in the right way so that we're prepared to actually arrive at that particular goal. And then, of course, the third question comes up, uh, how will I get there? What's the steps I need to take? Now, for younger people, these things are logical and they make sense, but sometimes we can get into routines and we switch the calendar and we, we, we've got a calendar hanging on the wall and we flip month by month, we flip it over and then it comes to December 31st and we take that calendar off and put the new calendar on. And it's somehow just, we do that mechanically. But I trust this morning as I share for a few minutes here about this that in our spirits that we take a, a check and as we've gone through the calendars, we quickly take 2017 off and we flip through the pages starting with January of 2017, February, March, April, as we go down and we ask ourselves some of these questions. What has happened in 2017? Which landmarks were established? Did I know on January 1st where I wanted to be in December 31st? And this is where the Bible helps us. It gives us direction because what happens is that as we do that individually, we have to do that corporately as well. You, you do it uh, as an individual, and then you get married. You do it as a couple. You sit down as a couple, and you discuss your year 2018. What do we want to do? What, where are we going to go? Uh, who are we? Can't do we have the giftings, capacities, abilities to get there? And then, of course, when you have children, that comes into the equation where you sit down with the kids as well, and you help the kids and work them through so that as a family you succeed. You do that in the business world. You do it in the, as a corporations in the places you work, whether you own your own business or you're working for someone else and you're, you're in leadership position. doesn't matter what department. You, you sit down and you discuss the big picture moving forward. And so we do that in the church as well. And so as a church, we sit down as a church leaders and we ask ourselves some of these fundamental questions. What happened in 2017? Who are we as a church? Uh, wh what is our goal for 2018? And then, of course, how do we get there? Big questions for early in the morning. Well, Let's look at the very first one. Who am I and who are we in the body of Christ? 
And I just want to look at some of these because once we know who we are, it really helps us to make sure that our goal and our destiny and the vision that we have is going to be in the right place. That we don't manufacture something from ourselves and then establish a wrong goal. So unlike... Unlike the poor man in the desert at noontime with the clouds and the wind and the lack of compass who knows no direction. Within the body of Christ, first of all, individually, everyone seated here this morning who has accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, this question, who am I, has been given to us very, very clearly. And this is why Christians can never be, can never be aimless goal-less, destiny-less. We always have a goal. We always have a vision. We always have a place to go. Why? Because we are told who we are. We don't have to manufacture that by ourselves. The first one is, we're going to take a few minutes to look at some of these. The first one is, is that we are the body of Christ. And please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12, 27. It's not going to be on the overhead, so uh, let's take it off there, please. And let's look at that, because I want you to look at your own translation uh, on that. Okay, let's take a look at um, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. I see some people looking at me. Can we hold their Bibles up? Can we hold them up this morning? Okay. Wow. This, this uh, sets our goal. This sets our destiny. I, 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 can't, I can't live a day without it. It's impossible. I get up in the morning and it helps me get through my day. And so I... Thank you for those of you who come to church with your Bibles and pen to mark it up. We want to look at a few things to identify who we are to move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to start reading from a few verses, starting with verse 27. All of you, or all of us, together are Christ's body, and each of us is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, are teachers. Then those who do miracles. Those who have the gift of healing. Those who can help others. Those who have the gift of leadership. Other translations say administration. And those who speak in unknown tongues, languages. And if Paul would have more time, he'd probably write out a whole list of things. And so the question comes to each one of us is what gifts do we have? What gift do you have? What are you operating in? First of all, in your own individual life. And as we go through this, whether we're going to be looking at a few things like the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, royal nation, the holy priesthood, and a few, a few uh, items like this which help set up our destiny. We're going to look at it both individually and corporately. Who are we in Christ Jesus? Who are you in Christ Jesus? Who am I in Christ Jesus? And then together, who are we together? Why are we here in Kuwait? Well, this passage tells us that we are the body of Christ. What does that mean as far as the past? If we... <laughs> If we are now the body of Christ, if each one of us is a member, all of us have been given gifts, whether you're a small finger, whether you're a thumb, or whether you're the arm or the shoulder or the neck, there's different parts of the body. That's what we are now. Once you've accepted Christ Jesus, you're grafted into the body. All, all analogies, unfortunately, are limited. Physical analogies limit the spiritual reality. But picture it with me, because that's all we have to go with, is, is just pictures, word forms. The question comes then, well, what were we before? We were disjointed. We were not a member. What good is my little finger if the doctors were to make an operation and take this finger off and I place it down on the table? Of what value is that finger? The body 
is missing something and the finger is not going anywhere. But that's a portion, an illustration, a little bit of what it means to be not part of the body of Christ. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, I'm here to remind us all that we are not a part of a body sitting on a table. We are part of the living body of Christ Jesus. That makes you and I intricately involved with each other's lives. Church is not something you wake up on a Friday morning, do routinely, take out your pen on your calendar and make a tech, tick box and say, okay, I've done that. I filled my religious duty. We don't go to church. Why? Because we are the church. We are the church. Uh, unfortunately, our English language messes these words up. Other languages have two different words between the, the physical building of a church and the body of Christ. But you and I are the body of Christ. When you've accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, you become a part of the body. Jesus is the head. And that's why we in this church, we are adamantly opposed as leadership to using names which are ascribed only to Jesus Christ. We do not say we do not have any leadership beyond the local church eldership because we don't have that right from the Word of God. And when you see organizations where they call the head of the church, they call them exactly that, some human being, or the supreme leader of the church, uh, folks, the red flags are out. Because in the body of Christ, there's only one head, and that head is Jesus Christ. In this church here at TLC, we have elders, and it's a plurality of a team working together to make sure that we are listening to the voice of God and the head of God and functioning together as a unit so that the body, you and I, can fulfill, first of all, your individual purpose and then secondly, together as a congregation of what we're doing. Well, this is what it means in the past. If we're looking at the past, we were disjointed at one time, but we are now part of the body of Christ. And uh, you can already tell with those, there's always some people who always want to outsmart themselves. And they say, no, we don't have to go to a local church. All that we can do is we can stay at home, read the Bible, and listen to some sermons, and uh, be a part of the body of Christ. Well, how long can the finger be disconnected and put on the table and still think it's part of the body? For an accident, maybe for a short time, a few seconds, a few minutes. But if the doctors don't fuse it back in, it dies. By the word of God, by definition, we are accountable one to another. By definition. We don't make that definition. That comes here from the word of God. Number two, the present, it unifies us. It unifies us. We are held together. Veins, nerves, muscles, joints, they hold the individual parts together. And that's why it's so important. And that's why we do what we do. We've got the bulletin. You've, you've got that inside there. Take, take a look at that. We've got Christian education classes. We have got uh, prayer meetings. You, you received this this morning? Did anyone not get one this morning? Ushers, you feel free to uh, move around and uh, pass it. Does anyone need one this morning still? You take a look to see what's all happening. Prayer and fasting. Next, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be having this. I think it's actually next service, isn't it? The fifth, yes. This service, next, uh, the, the first services of, of January on all of our services will be turned into prayer meetings because prayer is who we are. As the body of Christ, that's what we do. No different than, than, the, than the veins. What does a vein do? A vein carries blood. That's what a vein does. If a vein stops carrying blood, it stops functioning to what, it, what it's supposed to be, and that's prayer. Prayer keeps us alive. That's who we are as the body of Christ. We are praying people. 
We're also involved in Christian education. We feed ourselves information. If, if, you're, uh, if your little finger hurts because, uh, let's say, it got jammed in a door, you know what happens? Messages through the nerves get sent up to the head. <laughs> the head processes the information and sends back directives. In other words, get your finger out of the door. <laughs> Don't keep it there because the next person who's going to open and close the door is going to do the same thing. Your brain tells your finger what to do. We each are connected directly to the head. We don't need a mediator. We don't need some priest or someone between us and God to tell us what to do. And that's why we have preachers here not to tell us what to do, but to remind us of what God tells us to do and to look at the Word. And that's what all of our Christian education classes are for, so that we understand that each one of us is directly linked to the head. And Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and he's the head of your life, and he wants to give directives directly to you. And I'm so thankful that we do not have a human mediator, but Jesus is our mediator who comes before the Father. And we don't have to pay anything for that. Praise God. Salvation is free. Communication is free to God. Be very, very careful for anyone who prays for you and requires money from you. We heard this again just recently of people coming through Kuwait and standing behind the pulpits and starting to put price tags on their prayers. God help us in the church of Jesus Christ when these things begin to happen. It happened for too long in the time of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. We've turned away from that. And even they have recognized their mistakes through the Reformation. It's amazing how people try these things again. Let's be very diligent and awake in the kingdom of God. Number three is the future. We look at the past, the present, and the future. What's the future? Well, the, the implication is if we're part of the body of Christ and we're sown in and we're a part of the hand, if we go back to this analogy, that simply means is that the the plans and our brother read it you read it uh, who one of you read it from this morning from isaiah okay god's ways are higher than our ways now we just want to make a a, a, a comment on that scripture okay and this is why you, you hear me very very seldom ever preach from the old testament first i preach from the new testament and then i go back to the old testament because the new testament translates the old in that passage talking about God's ways are higher than our ways. And the, it would seem to imply, therefore, that we don't know what God wants. Correct? Because his ways are higher. But read what Paul says in Corinthians. He says, we have the mind of Christ. We know what he wants. We can't say, God, I don't know what you want. No, he has given us his spirit. And that's what Paul says. I have given you my spirit so that you do know what I want, God says. And that's why we're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why we're supposed to be speaking in tongues and communicating with our Father directly so that we understand His will and understand His thoughts because we have the mind of Christ. And so that passage was fulfilled in the New Testament. And in particular, not just through Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, but also on the day of Pentecost. So that we come in and we become a part of the body, so that the hand doesn't do its own thing, but rather it is united with the entire body. And as Jesus gives the directives, first of all for our individual lives and then our corporate life, as Jesus gives the directives, we are a part. This small finger is a part of the success in the whole body. And so when one member succeeds, they all succeed. And this is why as Christians, we help one another, we serve one another, so that we can grow in the success in Christ Jesus. Because if one member suffers, we all suffer. But as we're linked together in the body of Christ, we will see his uh, glory be manifest. And so we are destined as individual members to be successful. Not because we're alone. In fact, when we're alone, we will not be successful. But working together, we can move forward. And our entire body can move in a direction and arrive at a goal. And God is glorified as a direct result of that. Well, that was a little bit about the body of Christ. Another example of who we are, and that is the bride of Christ. So there's a different picture now in Christ Jesus. And this one now has to deal with, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
and verse 2. We're going to look at a couple of different passages. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, that is Christ. I promised you as a pure bride. Uh, to, b- Paul makes a, a comment here, but in Ephesians, turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 5. He elaborates this and gives us a bit more detail of, of this brief statement he says at that time. In, in Ephesians 5 verse 25, let's take a look at that there. Ephesians 5 verse 25. Uh, for husbands, so he's giving directives to the individual family members of what they're supposed to do. For wives, this means submit to your husbands. Oh, that's 22, verse 25. For husbands, this means love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Who are we as TLC? What's our vision for 2018? Number one, we are the body of Christ. Number two, we're the bride of Christ. Now look at the, uh, the destiny. We're talking about destiny, trying to arrive somewhere, trying to get somewhere. This, we've stopped in the desert. Things happen, and we've got to move forward individually and as a church. A bride without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. For those that are married here, think back to the day of, of the wedding. And how much time and energy and effort the bride puts in to make herself ready. Lots of time. Rightfully so. These are, this is a big day. Lots of pictures going to be taken. Lots of guests. Want to look the best. He says, let's go on here in verse 31. There's something profound here. 31 and 32 as the scripture says a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one this is a great mystery but it is an illustration of the way christ and the church are one mystery a great mystery it is profound paul says but he's speaking about christ and the church who are we In addition to being the body of Christ, now there's another analogy. We are the bride of Christ. Individually, you and I are the bride of Christ. Corporately, as a family, we're the bride of Christ. And what's interesting is that it says here that Christ makes his bride ready for himself. If we look again at the past, present, and future implications of this, because this is what we do at a year end. We look back to 2017 and then move forward to 2018. There's, there's two ways you can in, interpret this word. Um, uh, one of the translations says pure. Others say virgin. Uh, the two ways, whichever way you go, we'll look at both of them. One of them being uh, immature, virgin, who is yet a uh, single uh, a girl growing up. Okay? We, that, that, if we go with that analogy, it's the, it's the picture of immaturity. And there's lots of forgiveness when people first come into the body of Christ. Because they come in uh, growing up. They've they got, they got to grow up. They've got to learn the things of God, learn the mannerisms of God. And uh, whichever way they've been going before, they're just kind of happy and happy-go-lucky and going. And God says, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you, I'm forming you, I'm fashioning you, I'm pointing you in a direction. And this is what mothers want to do with their daughters and parents with their, with their daughters, is point them towards, and with their sons, point them in towards a direction to, uh, to live right and to do right, uh, abstain from any sexual relationships at all until the day of the wedding. 
Why? So that they can, the two can be united together. This is a profound mystery. And then once the union's there, then comes the maturing process as both husband and wife mature and grow on together. Then we look at the future. The purpose of this is for reproductivity and blessings to other people. And so it is in the church family as well. Uh, we may come in, and that's why we do not appoint new converts into positions of leadership. We allow them to mature, to grow up, and figure life out, figure out the Christian life. And then as we work together and we come together, then we formulate one another, we help each other. And then in, as, as we're seasoned in Christ Jesus, it's our prayer that each one of us reproduce spiritually, that we mentor people, we help people, a simple way of doing it, you can simply ask yourself the question, if you were not part of TLC, what difference would it make to TLC? If you were not to come here, what difference would it make to the body? And simply answering that question, then all of a sudden we realize, okay, wow, no, I am needed. Or, ooh, I'm not doing things. Maybe I should do things. In a family, husband and wife with children, if the husband opts out and says, I don't want to be a part of this family, what are the implications there? Heavy. They are severe. Each member is needed. And unless we get to the stage where we see ourselves as the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, then I dare say we don't know where we're going. Because if you understand, if each of us understand that we're the bride of Christ and that we are needed by each other and wanted by God, we'll move forward. And we have a goal. We have a vision. And we'll move forward. The other way of looking at this uh, word of, uh, of, of this virgin is, is in other translations they say pure. She's pure. And the difference here is talking, uh, the contrast here would be that of an adulterous person, one who prostitutes themselves. You say, well, how does this fit in the pride of Christ? Well, there's people who call themselves Christians on Friday morning and then Sunday morning at work, it's a different story. Or Monday morning, or Tuesday morning. And what we need is a clear understanding of who we are. I am the bride of Christ on Friday morning as much on Saturday morning and Sunday morning and Friday night and Saturday night 24-7. I am destined by God to be pure, spotless, and without blemish. One amen. <laughs> That's who we are. We don't make this up. This is the word of God. It comes to us. And w the purpose of this, if we follow this through, then it's the, it, it, it has to deal with the faithfulness that's there. And we all know this, those that are married. As you grow, the longer you're together, husband and wife, and as long as you keep instilling into your marriage bank trust, your trust account is high, and you can trust each other. Husband, trust their wives. Wives, trust their husband, and you grow in love. And that's the purpose of it, so that the children can grow up where they see husband and wife loving each other. And then... To be glorified. Jesus wants to show off his bride. What man on a, on a wedding day would stand here as the groom and then his bride comes and he goes, Oh no, <laughs> you don't do that. You stand there proud and you say, Look at my wife. And people are looking, they're amazed. But folks, this is who we are. We are in Kuwait, the bride of of Christ. When people see you and me 24-7, they see Jesus Christ. 
tall order. But that's our destiny. That's our goal. That's the direction in which we were pointed. Speaking of families, a quick interjection. Congratulations, Justin. Yes. Twins. It's this week, him and his wife, gave, she gave birth actually a week ago, isn't it now? A week ago to uh, two healthy, beautiful little babies, twins. So God bless you and uh, prosper in the Lord Jesus. This is life. It's natural. Reproduction. And then kids take on the character of the parents. And as we, as the bride of Christ, take on the character of Christ, who's the husband who takes the leadership. Well, there's a lot more to go with this. I need to wrap this up. Let's wrap this up here too. To arrive at our destiny, we must have both word and spirit knowledge of our being. Both word and spirit. So we can have the word. The word is here. And we read it. And that's why it's very important to make sure we're constantly reading the New Testament. Constantly. Because it's the word of God. And as we pray when we read, the Spirit of God will make it these words alive. Otherwise, they can just be dry, dusty words. But as we pray in our devotion life, we pray before we start reading, we pray while we're reading, we pray after we're reading, that God would make these words alive in us. And it's my prayer for each one of us as we go into 2018, that we understand who we are, and that we are not like a man in a desert with no directives which to go. But when we wake up every morning, we know exactly where we're going. Because we know exactly who we are. It is impossible for a born-again Christian to ever be defeated, to feel defeated. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. And so when that feeling of any time there's defeat or depression, those words cannot be in the vocabulary of Christians. Impossible. And if it is, if it is, I dare say we have lost our vision, and our destiny, and our goal. Because anyone with a goal, a dream, vision, hope, faith, love, cannot be depressed. It's not compatible. And so if there is depression, then we need direction. If there's despondency, discouragement, then it's back to the Word, back to the Spirit, Because we have the mind of Christ and we have the spirit of Christ. If we as Christians, as the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, are ever depressed, how on earth is the world supposed to succeed? Who don't have Christ, who are not the bride of Christ. We, you and I, are the salt in this world. We help people with their direction. We have a compass. There's no such thing as allowing the clouds to come between us and the sun. When we're filled with the Spirit of God, because His Word gives us our vision. We, just to let you know, we as a church leadership sat down and discussed this issue of the vision of TLC. So this morning is a bit of a, just an open book to you of what we're talking about. Is that if we, first of all, as those who've been appointed as elders, uh, whether it's service elders or council, or church elders, we all are looking at this, is that we get it, we understand what it means to be the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. Because once we get that, then we'll move forward in the right direction. Otherwise, we're just another society. We're a club. We're a social or religious organization. And God forbid that we ever reduce ourselves down to a society, a good charitable society. Never, never. We are the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. Well, to arrive at our destiny, we must have word and spirit knowledge of who we are, our being, both individually and as a church. I look at Galatians 1.4. Please turn with me to Galatians 1.4. Take a look at this here, our past. Who were we in the past? What kind of world did we come from? Jesus gave, Galatians 1, 4, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. 
the beauty of the Bible is that it allows us to be honest. It really allows us to be honest. It, has, it gives us the proper perspective of looking at reality, yet not being depressed by it. What's reality? The reality is we live in a dark, evil world. The world is evil, folks. Why? Because it's run by Satan. The God, small g, of this world is Satan. And he's evil. And he wants people not to know God and his son, Jesus Christ. But Jesus has overcome him and has taken away his authority. But he's still alive, Satan is. And so he rules in the hearts of people, of anyone who has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. He is their God. And what it means now is that we have to recognize that. And we don't get depressed by that. In fact, we get encouraged by it because we then understand our destiny as lights of this world, as salt in this world, as people who give directives, who give direction, who have focus. We've got character. We've got, we've got blamelessness, not because of ourselves, but because of the righteousness of Christ Jesus around us. And we can help people. We are here to serve other people and to make sure they go in the right we are rescued from this evil generation we were once living in that but jesus christ has rescued us from that that's exactly what paul says he goes on in colossians just turn a few pages over colossians 1 uh, 1 uh, verse 13 colossians 1 13 here he states this transition that happened from this evil world He says here, uh, verse 12, Always thanking God the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live where? In the light. We don't live in darkness. It doesn't matter how dark the world is. (laughs) It doesn't matter. Why? Because I've got access to the light switch. And the light bulbs are working. And so we don't have to live in darkness. We don't have to live in ignorance. If we're born again, believers, child of you're a child of God this morning. The Spirit of God is alive in your life. You don't have to live in darkness. We don't have to live to the pressures of the evil world. Why? We just simply turn the light switch on, right? Whenever anything comes that's depressing, cast it out in Jesus' name. Don't accept it. Someone says a bad word to you at work, rebuke it. Don't accept it. You don't have to accept bad words. Why? We accept the good words. That's is what exactly what was prayed this morning. Every weapon formed against us shall not prosper. We have the Word of God. And we have the Spirit of God. Walk through life with the lights on. Don't let darkness overpower us. Colossians 1.13 tells us this, For He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. I couldn't buy my way out of darkness. I can't do it. Jesus died for me. He paid the price. He has rescued me. I couldn't do it. Then we come to Revelation chapter 21 and you're going through the book of Revelation and all, all things end up in Revelation. So let's find out about these things in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. Look at what it says here in Revelation 21, 2. It says, uh, well, let's start with 21. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And so this imagery is carried on right to the very end. And, on, and Paul, or John, on the, the When he saw this revelation, this is what God showed him. This beautiful bride dressed for her husband. We don't dress for ourselves. We don't make ourselves in discipline. And we don't go through prayers and fasting and Christian education. We don't do these things for ourselves. We do that so that we can conform to our husband, Christ Jesus. We can conform as members of the body to the head of the body. And then take a look at verse 9. And then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come with me, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And so he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. 
It shone with the glory of God and sparkled as a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. As crystal. And it goes on to describe the beauty of this city, which is the bride of Christ. And this is who we are. Well, we haven't got time this morning to talk about the royal priesthood, holy nation. All of this is found in 1 Peter 1, 9. And I'll just read it here. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for its possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of the one having called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we ask ourselves, how then ought we to live? How do we live? Well, we live just like it says in Hebrews 12. And that's a text we started with in Hebrews 12, verse 2. We fix our eyes on Jesus. In the body of Christ, and I know many of us here come from different church traditions, church background, different cultures. When we're looking forward with TLC and as we look for 2018, we do not dig back into our church traditions to tell us where we go forward. We don't do that. Why? Well, first of all, we all come from different church traditions. Secondly, why we don't do that, and the more obvious one, is because we have one common textbook. And this textbook, the 66 books in here, the New Testament in particular, tells us who we are. And it doesn't matter so much what our past is and what traditions we've come from. Because not all of them are that great. Some church traditions literally keep people out of the kingdom of God. Literally. Keep them away. The word of God is not preached and different things happen. And we're not here to talk about that. we, We know that. And that's why you're here this morning. You've come to a place, a trust, where you get fed Friday by Friday. We're so thankful for our elders, Sherry and and Sonia and the other elders here who are preaching. Preaching the Word of God. It's the one, the Word of God, the Word and the Spirit here. Tell us who we are as TLC, in which direction we go. We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We will be one day in this future beautiful picture of the bride of Christ coming down from heaven. If we want to be effective individually, then corporately in Kuwait. And then when you leave Kuwait and go back to your home country, wherever that is, it's my prayer. As one of the elders here of this church, is that we'll have understood who we are. And that no matter how many clouds come through, no matter how much the wind blows, and it seems we have no compass or things in life, but as a Christian, we have the Word and the Spirit in us, which never, ever, ever loses direction. Why? Because we're always looking at Jesus, so we always know where we're going, and we are not aimless, but we are fixed on Christ Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith and who goes before us because he went forward. He's went and he kept going forward no matter how black the clouds came. In fact, we talk about blackness. When Jesus was hung, hanging on the cross, it wasn't the clouds. It was absolute darkness that came far beyond what clouds could ever produce. But yet he persevered and he saw it. Why? Because of the joy set before him. He knew what was coming. And all that we have to do is just be like little kids when they don't know what to do and their dad's walking, just hang on to their dad's hand <laughs> and they just trust their dad that he's going to bring them through and get them to their, to their destination. And that's who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the destiny that you have for us individually and then as a body of believers here at TLC. We commit ourselves to you for 2018. Guide us, direct us, O Lord Jesus. Help us not to be wandering off to the side or getting ourselves splattered and dirty, but Lord, keeping ourselves pure and clean in you, staying attached to you. Help us with these things, O Lord Jesus, so that we can receive the fullness of what you've got for us individually and corporately. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.